Well, please remain standing for the reading of God's Word. This morning we will be looking in the Gospel of Luke chapter 19, and we will read verses 11 to 27. You can find it on page 878 of your pew Bible. We hear now the reading of God's holy word. As they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. He said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minas and said to them, engage in business until I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know what they had gained by doing business. For the first came before him saying, Lord, your mina has made ten minas more. And he said to him, well done, good servant, because you have been faithful in a very little you shall have authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, your mina has made five minas. And he said to him, And you are to be over five cities. Then another came, saying, Lord, here is your mina, which I kept laid away in a handkerchief, for I was afraid of you. You are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit in, reap what you did not sow. He said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit and repairing what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank and at my coming I might have collected it with interest? And he said to those who stood by, take the mina from him and give it to the one who has the ten minas. And they said to him, Lord, he has ten minas. I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. But as for these enemies of mine, who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the living God shall stand forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray together. Our God and our Father, we pray as you would speak this day through your word. Might our hope in life and in death be found in Christ Jesus our Lord. Show us him. By the power of your spirit, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As we open Luke chapter 19 this day, this morning, I want to know, I want to tell you a bit of its significance. Not that you've been keeping count, but it's been almost a year since we were in Luke chapter 9. Now, why is that important? You thought, we're in Luke 19, why are you talking about Luke chapter 9? If you were with us last week, Pastor Schmidt, in fact, alluded to Luke chapter 9. He was talking about Peter, Jesus, and Peter, and Peter's confession of Christ. And, and Jesus is saying to him, there's a blessing, Peter, that you have that did not come from you. You were given spiritual sight by the Holy Spirit to see such truths. These things have been revealed to you. If you remember what Luke is doing at this time in Luke 8 and even into 9, you've got this confession of Peter and then it moves to the transfiguration of Christ. The glory of Christ is being revealed to Peter, James, and John. And as Christ would descend the mountain and come down, you remember there's there's a healing that Jesus performs on on a little boy who has an unclean spirit. And Jesus is telling His disciples and His people, I must die. I'm going to die. I must go to Jerusalem. And you guessed it. What kind of conversation would you have with that information other than, well, who's the greatest in the kingdom of God? 
That is where the disciples found themselves. But Luke says something very significant as soon as that is done. In Luke chapter 9, in verse 51, this is what Luke says. When the days drew near for him, speaking of Jesus, to be taken up, taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Now, I told you we're about a year from those words. Why do you need to know those words? Luke chapter 9, verse 51, is a, it's a turning point. Perhaps you're familiar with this. Maybe you're, maybe you're not. What happens after Luke 9, 51, all the way to our text, is often referred to as the travel narrative. Jesus has told his disciples, I need to die, and I must die in Jerusalem, and everything that he's done from 951 until now is Jesus' march to Jerusalem. And so we've been in it for a year. It didn't take him a year, but this is what we've been given our attention to, is what is Jesus doing on his way to the cross, on his way to Jerusalem. And so what he has suggested in 951 and where we are coming now is the culmination of his ministry. In fact, if you've already kind of read ahead, where we are moving immediately following is the last week of Jesus' life. Jesus is about to die. And isn't it striking to you what he says before he enters Jerusalem? What he wants to say to his disciples. He tells them a parable. Now again, Luke has done this on several occasions. You're not left wondering, why is Jesus saying this parable? What's the purpose? Maybe we need to try to figure it out. No, he tells you, doesn't he? You can see it in verse 11. As they heard these things, he, that is Jesus, proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear Immediately, Luke is telling us the reason why he's telling them this parable is the disciples, yes, they don't seem to understand that Jesus is going to die. He's told them three times, but they're not getting it. But they do understand where they're going. They're not just wandering around trying to figure out, well, which road does this take us on? They're very clear when we get to Jerusalem, something is going to happen. They don't seem to understand that he's going to die, but they know why they're going to Jerusalem. There's something about this place. And what is it that they think is going to happen? They think now's the time. Jesus is going to sit on his throne and he's going to rule. We're going to be under his rule. You can sense the expectations that the disciples have about this city. And so Jesus tells this parable. And I want to look at this parable under three headings. The first is a a king's comparison. And then we'll look at a king's charge. And finally, a king's return. Look with me in verses 11 and 12. a, A king's comparison. You might not know this, but as this parable is Unfolding As it's opening up, there is a comparison that almost every single member in the audience would have immediately knew. There is a context to what Jesus is saying, a historic context. It's about the year 4 B.C. Now that to us sounds like a very long time ago, but I want you to understand what that would have meant for them. The year 4 B.C. is roughly 37 years prior And so you're talking to some people who would have been alive during this time. This is what would have been known as recent history. We can remember what the times were like. We can remember what happened, what took place. And so what is the context that is taking place in 4 BC? Well, there's King Herod. It's Herod the Great. He's given this title of king. He's not Caesar, He's given the title of king. Now, why was he receiving that title? He received that title from the people because of how he dealt with the Parthians. He was militarily victorious in putting them out and protecting the people. And so he did that, and they provided for him this title of of king because of his success. It was not an assumption that if you took a throne, 
or took some kind of position of authority, you would be given this title of king. No, he had earned it. Now, we might not agree with King Herod the Great. We might not agree with what he was doing, but this is how he got his title, king. Well, as he was dying, it was clear that he had written into his will, as it were. My son, Archelaus, he is to receive over half of my kingdom. Scholars disagree whether or not he actually wrote into the will and also the title of king or, or of not. But it's not disputable. Archelaus, his son, as Herod the Great dies, he wants to take the throne and he wants this title of king. He wants to go to Rome and he wants to tell Caesar, Caesar, give me this title of king. And so Archelaus actually makes his way to Rome. And he's on his way and he thinks with his entourage, I'm going to come back and I'm going to be the king. But he did not know that there was opposition. There were some 50 Palestinian delegates that had already gone to Rome. 8,000 Jews that had gone to Rome in opposition of Archelaus. Now, why were they in opposition of Archelaus? Because he had killed 3,000 Jews and threw their bodies in the temple just to show his dad his strength. And so they said, well, we don't want him as king. He's evil. He's incompetent. He's inept. Do not make this man king over us. Whether or not Caesar agreed entirely, he at least gives Archelaus a, a bit of a provisional rule. He gives him a title ethnarch, think governor. And he sends him back and he says, let's see how it goes. Obviously, Archelaus was not going to be liked by the people, but he had received the, the territory, the kingdom, and yet he has not received this title. Now, everybody would have understood who Archelaus was. Did you know that as Jesus is telling this parable in Jericho, do you know where Archelaus' palace was? In Jericho. There is perhaps the shadow of Archelaus right behind, the silhouette as it were, of what they saw as Jesus was telling this parable. They understood these opening words in verse 12. There is history here. Something really has happened. And yet what Jesus is saying, there's another kind of king. I'm a king. He is, he's speaking of himself. Do you remember last week with Pastor Smith and we looked at blind Bartimaeus? Do you remember what blind Bartimaeus says as Jesus passes by? Have mercy on me, son of, of David. Why would you use such a phrase? What would have been the understanding when you use the phrase son of David? It's a, it's a title. It's a picture of kingship, of, of royalty. Blind Bartimaeus, who can't see physically but spiritually, is saying, there's God's king. I know this man. He is the king of that God has sent forth. He's not going to come in the manner by which worldly men will think because His kingdom is not of this world. Isn't that what Jesus tells Pilate? I have a heavenly kingdom. Earth is my footstool. I'm the king of kings. There's a man, probably not well known by many, He's no longer living. He was a pastor for, I think, 40 years out in California at Calvary Baptist Church. His name is S.M. Lockridge. And he has a whole sermon. Few people actually listen to the whole sermon. Most people just look at the YouTube video. I would tell you, you should listen to the whole sermon. But in his, in his sermon, he's talking about who is the king. What is the king like? Let me read to you just a, just a snippet of what he says about Jesus as the king. My king was born king. He's king of the Jews, king of Israel, king of righteousness, king of the ages, king of heaven, king of glory, king of kings and lord of lords. Now that's my king. Do you know him? My king is the only one whom there are no means of measure that can define his limitless love. 
No far-seeing telescope that can bring into visibility the coastline of his shore of supplies. No barriers can hinder him from pouring out his blessing. He is enduringly strong, entirely sincere, eternally steadfast, immortally graceful, imperially powerful, impartially merciful. That's my king. Do you know him? Just as a side note, doesn't it put into perspective how weak we are in prayer, what it means to adore God? That we're so quick to try to ask God for things because we cannot spend enough time to think, who's my king? And what is he like? There is this comparison that is coming in the Gospel of Luke right here. Jesus is not talking about Archelaus. He is absolutely talking about Himself. And He is saying the circumstances might appear similar, but the character of the King is entirely different. And so as the disciples are thinking, the Kingdom of God is coming immediately. It's about to be set up. Jesus begins by saying, a nobleman, well, he went into a far country. Jesus is not speaking of Rome. He's speaking of heaven. He's going to die. He's going to rise. And as he would enter his own home, the shouts of the saints and of the angels attesting to here is the king. It's a comparison. Jesus is saying, I'm going to establish my kingdom. And so you have a comparison of kings, but Jesus moves on in this parable as to say, what is the responsibility, the king's charge? You can see it beginning in verse 13. He calls 10 of his servants and he gave them 10 minas. What he's saying there is quite simple. He's got 10 servants and he gives each one a mina. Now you might not know what a mina is. It's it's not an exuberant amount of money, but it's not insignificant. You're looking somewhere in the ballpark of say, three to four months' wages. This is the amount that is given to each servant. It's about this time where some will suggest that this parable sounds oddly familiar. Something like Matthew's parable in, the, in chapter 25. It's the parable of the talents. And I want to let you know, these are not the same parables. They're very, very different. There might be a similarity in the fact that we are called to be faithful. That's clear. But the parable of the talents, you can go and read it. Jesus is talking about entrusting to His servants different forms of money, different amounts of money, and how is it that you use what God has given to you? This is not the case. Everyone here receives the exact same amount. They all receive one mina. Jesus is not talking about their abilities. He's talking about the deposit. This has a whole lot more significance on what you have received. What has been given to you. Everyone receives the same amount. What could Jesus be talking about there? What is it that everyone receives the exact same thing? I think he's talking about the gospel message. Everyone receives the exact same message. It's the same deposit. No one receives a different word. They all receive the exact same word. Same message, same deposit, same investment. If I need to paint it clear, let's be honest. Paul got the same message that Billy Graham, John Calvin, Peter, and you. We all have the exact same message, the same deposit. And what does Jesus say? What does Jesus look at? He gives each servant a mina, and what does he say to him? Engage in business until I come. Put the deposit to work. Use it. 
might it be useful to you, for you, and through you. What you do with this deposit might be different, but the deposit is nonetheless the same. All are called to do the same thing, to invest it. You might see a different return, but it is certainly not an issue of giftedness. It is undoubtedly an issue of faithfulness. What have you done with the deposit that you have received? It's a bit of a challenge, isn't it? You can see what Jesus is saying. The mina, what the world might say is insignificant. You know, that's not unique to this parable, is it? You might say, all I have is Christ and the gospel. And what does the world say to you? How insignificant and unimpressive you are. That that's all you cling to. That's all you have. That the world would look at this message and say, it's not much of a big deal. And yet, what does the gospel say of itself? It's the pearl of great price. It's the treasure in a field that you would give anything and everything for. It is the deposit from a king given to his servant and saying, put this to work until I come back. Isn't that what Jesus even told his own disciples? You can, you can probably see the verse in your own mind. Go and make disciples. Well, how are you supposed to do that? Teach them. Not your word. Not your thoughts. Not your ideas. Teach them what? All that I have given you, commanded you, he says. Teach them that they might observe it. It's incredible. We haven't gotten there yet. You can see a bit of a preview of how powerful this is. What does verse 16 say? It gives this implication that this deposit is such a big deal. All it needs is to be displayed. All it needs is to be trusted in because it works. It grows by its own power. You can think of Paul in 1 Corinthians 3. I planted, Apollos watered, God makes it grow. God works in and through the gospel. There is power in the gospel. You perhaps assume that I would say that. But do you believe that? That there is in fact power. There's power in the gospel for life. There's power in the gospel for growth. There's power in the gospel for healing, for help, for correction, for restoration. The gospel is a powerful message. It's not just for healing and health, is it? It also provides satisfaction for the people. It's what gives you joy. You heard the choir sing about it. They're talking about the gospel. This is what will take place in the gospel. And it's not meant to stay with you. It's meant to come into you and work through you. There's no investment like it. Because you're not supposed to hold on to this one. You're supposed to grab it and give it as often as you can. These disciples are misunderstanding. They misunderstand the kingdom of God because they think it's coming right now. They misunderstand the king of God, that what it's going to take for Jesus. They even misunderstand what it means to be a citizen of this king. And it's not because Jesus hasn't informed them. He has told them time in and time out. This is what it's going to mean. This is what it's going to be like. Jesus has clearly told them, I'm going to die, and it matters that I die. It's good for you that I die. And he's saying it over and over and over again. And he's not only saying that he's going to die, he's also telling his people in this entire travel narrative, this is what it means to love me. This is what it means to follow me. That's the focus of the travel narrative. What does it mean to be a disciple of Christ? And he's telling them, over and over and over again. And they just don't seem to get it, even though Jesus is clear on his expectations. You know, sometimes 
We talk about that, don't we? What should you expect as a Christian? Sometimes we use these illustrations. Maybe you've heard it. Here's a blank sheet of paper. I want you just to sign your name on the bottom line. And we say, this is what it means to be a Christian, that you're signing up to say, I'll do whatever, whenever, wherever for Jesus. There might be some measure of truth of what it means to be a Christian that says, I will do whatever, wherever, whenever. But I think we need to better understand that illustration. Jesus has never given you a blank sheet of paper as though you have no idea what's going to happen. You might not know every specific detail. You might not know most of the events. But can we not say Jesus is quite clear principally what it's like to be a Christian, what it means to follow him, what it means to love him. And in this parable, he gives you at least three words. The first that he's telling them is, you need to expect rejection. You're signing up to be rejected, and you need to prepare to endure it. As a Christian, you're, you're here to endure persecution. Did you see what happened in the parable? The, the servants who They've been receiving this mina, but what happens as soon as they receive it? They're, they're told to put it to work. In verse 14, it's almost like it's coming out of left field. Why are you saying that? But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him. What is he saying? This king that's going to a, a far country, do not expect that there's going to be some victory parade. And in fact, Jesus is trying to tell his disciples, you need to be alert because in a moment's time, people are going to be saying, Hosanna, but just hold your breath, because that's about how long it takes before they shout what? Crucify him. He's saying, you need to expect, let's talk about your working environment. This king is going to be hated and rejected, and as a servant of the king, you and I, we, we cannot think it will be different. We cannot think, because I love Jesus, they only hate him. They have no problem with me. In fact, if that's the case, we need to look in the mirror and go, am I really living like Christ has called me to live? That they would think something entirely different of him than of me. And Jesus is saying, we need to expect, we need to expect rejection, opposition. And that's not surprising to you. If I said, did everyone love Jesus? You know that that's not true. Yes, Paul will talk about his resurrection that more than 500 were appeared to. But it's not like we're talking about a population of 600. There are a million people here. There are lots of people who do not like Jesus. As a Christian, you're not in the majority. And you should not think that you are. Jesus might have been loved by many. He certainly was not loved by all. And he's being quite clear. I will be rejected. And so will you. And what he's saying to his disciples is, you need to expect rejection. But when I return, you won't receive that from me. I'll receive you into my kingdom. In this life, you have persecution. But what does Jesus say? Take heart. I have overcome. This king is giving a charge. And he's saying, put the gospel to work. But know that what it means to put the gospel to work is there will be many who hate you, who reject you, who oppose you. This is not a, this is not a sprint. This is a marathon. Prepare for endurance. And so the king charges the people. And then the king returns. And I recognize you're curious as to how long this sermon is going to be because we're only in verse 15. We're going to summarize quite quickly. But this king returns. It's an encouraging return. It's a scary return. Look at what happens. This, this king, he returns... Verse 15, is, it's, it's shoving you. It's, it's, it's pushing us into the future. And as the king returns, he settles accounts. But you, you see how 
quickly it is. The king doesn't return and go, you know what, let's just catch up. Why don't we grab a cup of coffee? How are things going? No, as soon as he returns, the books are opened. Let's find out what you did, how you did it. And we receive from Luke this, this incredible return, don't you? Jesus, he, he comes back and, and there are these two servants and they say, you gave me a mina and here are ten minas. Now you businessmen are licking your chops. That's a thousand percent. A thousand percent. That's quite the investment. Even the second one. It's 500 percent. But don't you see what happens? The humility of these servants? Because not a one of them came to Jesus, to this king, and said, look at what I did. Read what verse 16 says. None of them say, I. Look at what your mina did. What a humility about these servants. You can hear Romans 1, can't you? The power of God. The power of the gospel. It's for the salvation of all who believe, isn't it? You can see its nature of growth and of goodness. Because it is the power of God in His Word to work wonderful things way beyond what you or even I could do. These servants are seeing what happens because God's Word, it's not just power for salvation. It is undoubtedly that. Hebrew says it's a sharp sword. It's a two-edged sword. It delivers people from death. It turns people from enemies to children of God. It makes sons and daughters it brings about brothers and sisters. It builds the church even against the gates of hell. And it even calls for the sending out. This mina, this gospel is incredibly powerful. And you see Jesus' delight over the humility and the faithfulness. He says, well done. Well done, good servant. You see, Jesus is saying something important. Faithfulness is a really big thing. I wonder if you know the name Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor was a, a missionary to China. There are some great books about him, and there are some great books that he has written. He was there for many, many years. And this is what he says. A little thing is just a little thing. But faithfulness in a little thing is a great thing. You see, he says that at the end of about 19 years of ministry. A little thing is just a little thing. But faithfulness in a little thing is a big thing. That's what you see here with these servants. Faithfulness in one mina. Now, I told you that this passage is, is putting forth on this blank piece of paper three words, and I've, I've said it's rejection. I've said you've got to prepare to endure. What would be that third word? How about reward? Are you not blown away by the reward that this king gives to his servants? They got ten cities. Ten cities for merely maybe three years of labor or five cities for about a year and a half worth of labor. Do you see what he's saying here? The reward far outweighs what you deserve. Far is greater than what you have worked for. There is no such grace like this kind of grace. And you should call it grace. Why? Because the king doesn't have to do this. He very well could have said to his servants, this is your mission. You must do it. And you're not getting anything when I come back. He could have received all of it and not given anything back. That's well within his right. But instead, 
He rewards them abundantly because of faithfulness. And yet there is one. There's one called a wicked servant. Did you see it? In verse 20, Lord, here is your mina, which I kept laid away in a, in a handkerchief. He even tells you why. What does he say? I was afraid of you. You are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit and you reap what you did not sow. Now the king says right there in verse 22, I will condemn you with your own words. It's not a phrase as to say I agree with your own words. He's saying by your own description of me, I will condemn you. Because what is he saying? He's saying to this servant, really? Like that's really what you think of me? If that's really what you think of me, why didn't you put it in the bank and earn some interest? If I'm really that bad of a person, that evil of a, a ruler, why would you not have done the bare minimum duty to bring about some measure of interest? And you can imagine the audience. If you were reading this at face value, you could say at this point, that guy is an idiot. He's a fool. He's crazy. He's out of his mind. Why would anyone ever do something like that? How could you not have thought about what your job was? It was very clear. But I think Jesus is saying something there. How tempted are you to do something similar when times are hard? And you start to think, God, you've been really hard on me. These trials are too much. These circumstances are way more than I asked for. And can we just be honest? I deserve better. Do you ever think that way? Do you see what Jesus is doing here? He's saying, aren't you ready to say that's ridiculous? It might be true that trials are hard. It might be true that the burden is heavy. But does this king not give grace upon grace upon grace? Does this one not look at enemies and bring about children? Does this one not look at sinners and say, I'll save you? Don't you see the ridiculousness of our own hearts that we can quickly say, I'm just going to hold on to this and not do anything with it? Because he is a severe and difficult man. I think Jesus is painting a clear picture. There is rejection to take place. There is endurance. But he is saying, there's no one who will be rejected. No one who will endure in my name that will not receive much, much more in this life and even in the life to come. This parable, as I told you, it, it's right before Jesus enters Jerusalem. He's about to die. And he says, he says, put the gospel to work. Put it to work. Be good investors of the gospel. It's more than money. It's more than time. It's about it's about conversations. Are you putting the gospel to work in the, the words that you say to yourself and to others? It's about, it's about prayer. What do your prayers say about putting the gospel to work? Is everything me? God, do this for me. Or is there any time in which it's, God, I want to see you work in this community. I want to see you work next door, down the hall, across the parking lot. He's saying, put the gospel to work. Start asking big questions. What's my life for? What's it about? What, what do I want my legacy to be? How do I want to end? Do I want to end it putting it in a handkerchief? 
were putting the gospel to work. You are very clear, aren't you, why he called him a wicked servant. There's nothing in this passage that said, this guy stole a lot. There's nothing in this passage that said, you know what? He murdered people too. Why is he called wicked? Because he did nothing. He received a deposit. And he didn't do anything. He just held on to it. And all accounts are settled. And I want you to see nothing of what this wicked servant did thwarts the plans of this king. Nothing of what this wicked servant did brought any harm to the king. The only one who is affected by this wicked servant is him. He is the one who is condemned for his actions. He brought no suffering, as it were, to his master because this master needs not his servants. He is the master and he's in control of all. He can do as he pleases. And so do you see what Jesus is doing before he enters Jerusalem? It's a, it's a parable and he's saying, I want to invite you into something. I want to invite you into the greatest mission of your life. I want to invite you into this, this message. Put it to work. Put it to work in your own heart. Put it to work in your family. Put it to work in your church. Put it to work at your work. He's saying if you put it to work, you will enjoy something far greater than you can comprehend right now. And it all comes at the hands of the king. But you see, that leaves us with one question. Is the gospel worth such an investment to you? Is it worth the kind of investment that Jesus is talking about? Dale Ralph Davis pens these words, and I find it quite helpful. He's thinking about the environment by which we live, the difficulties of this life, and that of what the king is about to bring about. And this is what he says. We serve between the smile of Jesus and the frown of the world. We must decide which we value most. Brothers and sisters, I hope you'll put the gospel to work as a sign that says, I look forward to the smile of Jesus. I look forward to well done, good servant. Let's pray together. Our God and our Father, we thank you that we thank you that your word is powerful. That it brings people from death to life. That it blesses far more abundantly than we could ask or imagine. That it sustains the severest of circumstances of this world. And it secures us for the greatest commendation anyone could ever hear. Well done, good servant. Help us to be good investors of the gospel. Help us to not hide it or to lay it away in a handkerchief. Let us see the abounding grace of our King. And therefore, might we joyfully give it away. Make much of yourself, Lord Jesus, we pray. In your name, amen.